In this lecture video, we'll talk about two different topics. The first topic is an application of voltaic cells as batteries, and we'll go over the different kinds of batteries. In the latter part of the video, we're going to shift gears away from voltaic cells to electrolytic cells. This figure is a cartoon of a battery very similar to the one designed by Volta to disprove Galvani's hypothesis of animal electricity. And what a battery is, it's a series of individual voltaic cells. And in this voltaic cell, we have two different metals, and it is their electrical potential difference, or their cell potential, that gives rise to the spontaneous transfer of electrons. And when we place these individual voltaic cells in a series, that original cell potential then can be added up as a sum to give the overall voltage potential for the entire battery. There are three general categories of batteries. There are primary batteries that are non-rechargeable, secondary batteries that are rechargeable, and fuel cells are a distinct category because they are powered by a fuel and oxygen. One of the most popular battery is the alkaline battery. And if you've ever used AA or AAA, this is what that battery would look like inside. These are examples of primary batteries that are non-rechargeable. So the reason why they're called alkaline is because of the presence of potassium hydroxide paste, which is used as an electrolyte. So the redox reaction that happens inside this battery is between zinc and manganese dioxide to generate zinc oxide and manganese hydroxide. And if we follow the oxidation numbers on zinc, zinc is being oxidized from zero to plus two. So that would be our oxidation half reaction at the anode. The manganese on the other hand is being reduced from plus four to plus two, and that is our reduction half reaction. The overall cell potential for this reaction is 1.5 volts. The batteries often are labeled with positive and negative signs. And here, these match the signs that we would assign to the different electrodes in a voltaic cell. So zinc, which is the most reducing of the two reduced species in this redox reaction, and is also the anode electrode, would have a negative sign where the electrons originate. On the other hand, the positive sign is associated with this graphite rod, which is really an inactive electrode, and the actual oxidizing agent is the manganese oxide. Secondary batteries are rechargeable and largely based on nickel. Here we have three related nickel hydrogen or nickel hydride type batteries. Nickel hydrogen is the first, and then nickel cadmium hydride and nickel metal hydride. Although nickel cadmium hydride batteries have great performance, cadmium is toxic to the environment, and so disposal of these batteries is problematic. That makes these nickel metal hydrides really popular today, and the metal is actually an alloy of lanthanum and nickel metals. An amazing application of these batteries is in the Hubble telescope that was launched in 1990. And the Hubble telescope is outfitted with the solar power arrays so that it can use sunlight energy for electricity. However, there is a part of the orbit around the Earth where the Hubble telescope is in the shadow, and therefore it has to rely on batteries for its nighttime operations. Now the Hubble telescope has six nickel hydrogen batteries that are each 125 pounds. And so this module here is showing half of the batteries that are on the Hubble telescope. So this is three battery modules. The redox reaction run in nickel hydrogen batteries like the one on the Hubble telescope is shown here on the right. And if we follow the oxidation numbers, we'll see that hydrogen has an oxidation number of zero but becomes plus one in this proton form on this hydroxide group.
And so this is the oxidation half reaction. On the other side, nickel changes from plus 3 to plus 2. And so this is the reduction half reaction. Now, the nickel metal hydride, which is by far more popular, has a related redox reaction where instead of using hydrogen gas, now we can use that alloy metal hydride instead. And the second redox reaction has a good cell potential value of 1.4 volts. Fuel cells are different from other batteries in that they are open systems. And for that reason, sometimes these are called flow batteries because they have a flow in of reactants, typically a fuel source and oxygen gas, and an outflow of products. And because they use a fuel source and oxygen, essentially fuel cells are doing a controlled combustion redox reaction to generate electricity. Here's a schematic of a fuel cell that uses hydrogen as a fuel. So this is the reaction shown here where we have hydrogen plus oxygen to form water. And this has a very positive cell potential of 1.23 volts in the standard state. If we follow the oxidation number changes, hydrogen is being oxidized and oxygen is being reduced. Here are the two half cell reactions that take place in a hydrogen fuel cell. In this first reaction here, we have the oxidation of hydrogen gas to protons and electrons. And this hopefully will look familiar to you as the standard hydrogen electrode run in the reverse direction. So because this is a standard electrode, the half cell potential is set to be zero volts. The second reaction is the reduction of oxygen to give water. And this requires not only electrons, but also protons. We generally consider oxygen as a strong oxidizing agent, so therefore reducing oxygen has a very positive half cell potential of 1.23 volts. One thing I like to know is that not only does the number of electrons cancel out, but the number of protons cancels out. So this means that in between these two half reactions, not only do we have the flow of electrons, but we also have to have the flow of protons. Here's a scheme of how a hydrogen fuel cell would work. So first you'll notice that on the two sides of this fuel cell, we have inlets for the gas, hydrogen, and oxygen. And so both of these reactants flow in, and on one side, water, our product, flows out. Now, because these species that are undergoing redox reactions are not electrode material, we do need an inactive electrode. And so here we have platinum catalysts deposited on graphite. And these two electrodes are connected by a wire to allow electrons to spontaneously transfer from those lost from the oxidation of hydrogen to move towards the oxygen side where it gets reduced to water. Now in between here is a special type of membrane because we have to now allow for protons to migrate from the hydrogen half reaction into the oxygen half reaction. And so important components of this fuel cell are the inactive electrodes that have both platinum and graphite. And we also have a particularly special need for the salt bridge electrolyte that basically has to allow for proton exchange between these two half reactions. Hydrogen fuel cells are one vision for having a zero emission technology because they produce water and like fossil fuels, which combust to form carbon dioxide. To make this dream a reality still means overcoming a lot of challenges. In particular, the generation of hydrogen gas can be expensive. But the technology is being implemented and there are now vehicles being sold that utilize both the hydrogen fuel cell and electric vehicle technologies combined to power such cars. 
And so in this car schematic, we have these canisters that would house the hydrogen fuel. And this would be the fuel cell battery. And then there would be other batteries that would be working in concert. In the second part of the lecture video, we're going to talk about electrolytic cells. Electrolytic cells use electric energy input in order to drive a non-spontaneous redox reaction. In order to understand all the similarities and differences between a voltaic cell and an electrolytic cell, we're going to use this diagram where we have the same chemical species. We have tin and copper electrodes in both of these cells, and we have tin 2 plus and copper 2 plus solutions, again, in both of these cells. In the voltaic cell, we run this redox reaction in the spontaneous direction, where the cell potential would be positive. And this is where electrons flow from tin metal to copper 2 plus, reducing it to copper metal. In the electrolytic cell, we're actually running the electrons in the opposite direction, which is uphill in energy. And so copper is now the origin of the electrons, and they're being used to reduce tin 2 plus to tin metal. Now, because this chemical reaction has a negative cell potential of 0.48 volts, that means we need an energy input that is going to be positive or greater than 0.48 volts so that this reaction can be done. The primary difference between this voltaic and electrolytic cell is the sign of the cell potential. Other differences include that what is being oxidized and what is being reduced gets swapped between these two cells as well as the anode and cathode. So for instance, in the voltaic cell, the tin anode is being oxidized. But in the electrolytic cell, that gets swapped with the copper anode that gets oxidized. And whereas tin was originally an anode in the voltaic cell, now it becomes the cathode in the electrolytic cell. The flow of electrons has to now be in the opposite direction because in the voltaic cell, this electron flow is in the downhill or spontaneous direction. But in the electrolytic cell, now electron flow is in the non-spontaneous or thermodynamically uphill direction. So in the electrolytic cell, we actually have electrons flowing to the more reducing metal or the stronger reducing agent. Another subtle difference is that the signs of the anode and cathode are reversed. So in the voltaic cell, the anode where the electrons originate has a negative sign, but in the electrolytic cell, it's the cathode where the electrons arrive that has that minus sign. It's also important to bear in mind the similarities between a voltaic and electrolytic cell. And some of these similarities simply have to do with the definition of what is oxidation and reduction and where they happen at the anode and cathode. So in both cells, the oxidation always happens at the anode and the reduction always happens at the cathode. And because oxidations are where electrons are generated and reductions at the cathode are where electrons are used up, electrons will always flow from the anode to the cathode. Now, the signs of the electrodes are actually maintained such that the negative sign is always at the more reducing metal electrode, and the positive sign is on the less reducing metal electrode. So in both of these cells, tin, which is more reducing than copper metal, bears the minus charge, even though it changes roles from anode to cathode. Likewise, copper, which is the lesser reducing metal, bears a positive sign, whether it's the cathode in the voltaic cell or the anode in the electrolytic cell. So these signs will correlate naturally with the metal's potential differences. An important application of electrolytic cells is electrolysis where we can extract pure metal elements from their ores. 
And so this set of trivia questions is related to the next slide. What is the third most abundant element in the Earth's crust and also the most abundant metal element? What element was more precious than gold in the 19th century? And because of its status, it was chosen to form this pyramid cap that was used in the construction of the Washington Monument. The answer to those three trivia questions is aluminum. And part of the reason why aluminum was so precious was it had to be extracted from the bauxite rock where it was present as aluminum plus three in this hydroxide form. And through electrolysis, by the addition of three electrons, we can then form the pure aluminum metal. And this reaction, as written, has a negative standard cell potential of minus 1.66 volts, meaning that this would have to be done in the uphill direction in order to isolate this pure metal. Another application of electrolytic cell is electroplating. This is a process where you can deposit a nice shiny layer of a metal on a metallic object simply by electrolyzing the object while it's dipped into solution of the metal ion and then it's electrolyzed. So chrome plating, for instance, would give this nice, beautiful, shiny chrome layer that is also protective and will prevent rusting. And chrome plating then has this really simple half reaction where chromium three plus ions are reduced by three electrons to form chromium and metal. And again, by looking at the standard cell potential, we see that it is indeed negative. And so this is another reaction that would require energy input in order to be run. Electroplating and electrolysis often show up as stoichiometry problems where we want to calculate how much metal is formed or deposited in these electrolytic reactions. In this problem, zinc plating is used as a way of protecting an item from corrosion. How many grams of zinc can be deposited on a steel tank from a zinc sulfate solution when a 0.855 amp current flows for 2.5 days? In the first step to solve this problem, let's write out the half reaction. Because we start with zinc sulfate, that means we are beginning with zinc 2 plus ions and we're reducing them to form zinc metal, which requires two electrons. And from the table of half cell potentials, this reaction has a negative potential of minus 0 0.76 volts. Now we're solving for the amount of zinc metal that is formed in this electroplating process. And what's important to realize is that the limiting reagent in this reaction is actually the number of electrons that are used. And here we can use the fact that there is a two mole relationship between the electrons and the moles of zinc metal that would be produced. So next we're going to determine the number of moles of electrons that were used in this electroplating process. And to do so, we need to remember that current or units of amps is really just the flow of charge over time. And these have units of coulombs over seconds. And so we, if we want to solve for the total charge that's used in the process, we need to multiply current times time. And in doing so, we have 0.855 coulombs per second and because this is second, we have to convert the 2.5 days first into hours and then finally into seconds. And if we multiply all these values, all the units for time will cancel and we get 1.847 times 10 to the fifth Coulomb. So this is the total charge of running this much current for that long. But this is in terms of charge, and we really want it in moles of electron. This is where Faraday's constant can be used. If we divide this charge by Faraday's constant, then we get that that's equivalent to 1.914 moles of electrons. 
with the moles of electrons, now we can go back to this balanced equation and solve for the grams of zinc. So first, we're going to take the moles of electrons and convert that into moles of zinc using this 1 to 2 molar relationship. And next, we're going to multiply that by the molar mass of zinc metal. And that will finally give us as an answer that we're going to deposit 62.6 grams of zinc metal.